Before we begin, we would like to disclose a content warning to the audience. This video contains content related to violent behavior and criminal activity that may be upsetting or disturbing to viewers. In the past century, violent crime rates have reached a peak, especially those of serial killers. Resultingly, the public has searched for answers about why this occurred in the subsequent decades. One theory widely held in the public is one called the lead crime hypothesis, which seeks to blame the high prevalence of violent crimes on the epidemic of environmental lead exposure. Before we dive into the lead crime hypothesis, let's backtrack first and ask ourselves, what is lead? Sitting in group 14 in period 6 with an atomic number of 82 of the periodic table, lead, abbreviated as PB, is an element naturally occurring on Earth. It appears as a dull, silver-gray metal. Some of its physical properties include being soft, highly resistant to corrosion, has a low melting point, versatile, and is malleable. The discovery of lead is dated back to ancient times and has been known and used by humans for many centuries. In fact, the first evidence of lead mines dates all the way back to 6500 BC in Turkey. Because of its physical properties, lead can be easily manufactured into everyday appliances and systems. Examples of how it has been used in the past couple of centuries is as a corrosion-resistant metal for pipes, such as our drinking water pipes, as an additive in paint, a glaze for pottery, insecticides, hair dyes, and petrol or gas. Due to health concerns in the past couple of decades, these uses have now been banned. However, lead continues to be widely used for things such as car batteries, weights for lifting, cable sheathing, and much more. Now, it is clear that lead has been integrated into our societies for millennia. However, this is a serious issue. For thousands of years, human civilization was unaware of the toxic and detrimental health implications of lead. It is believed that lead's toxicity was recognized and recorded as early as 2000 BC. In fact, ancient philosophers have been documented to suspect health issues as a result of lead poisoning. Now, let's look into our current understanding of how lead behaves at a biological level. Lead does not occur naturally in our bodies, and rather, it comes from the Earth's crust and other sources in nature. However, it is well documented that it can accumulate in our bodies and cause serious health problems. To our bodies, it is toxic and it can even disturb human development and cause cancer. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention reports that no matter how we ingest lead, the health effects are the same. However, the body absorbs higher levels of lead when we breathe it in. When we absorb lead, it is stored in our bones, blood, and tissues. So once it's in our bodies, how does lead behave as a toxin? According to the World Health Organization, there is no known safe blood level concentrations, even with low levels causing significant health problems. As exposure to lead increases, the range and severity of symptoms and effects also increase. Lead exposure through various environmental and lifestyle factors and the subsequent adverse health effects have been very well studied. Exposure may happen in various ways. Generally, there are two forms. The first is lead poisoning, which is defined as the health effects of short-term overexposure to high levels of lead. The second are health effects from gradual, prolonged exposure to low levels of lead. The symptoms may occur slowly and are similar between the two forms of exposure, putting people at risk for serious diseases. Examples of these serious diseases lead may cause are cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, fertility issues, neurological disorders, and even death. Data has shown that the exposure to lead levels previously considered safe have long-lasting impacts on behavioral measures, suggesting that the central nervous system function has been altered irreversibly. Lead has detrimental effects on a person regardless of age, gender, or the exposure pathway. Lead neurotoxicity can be described as the altering of normal functioning in the central nervous system, which results in injury to the central nervous system. High levels of lead can attack the brain and lead to comas, convulsions, violence, and death. At a cellular level, lead mimics or suppresses important molecular functions of calcium, which has negative consequences on biological activities. In particular, it has a severe impact on the brain development, affecting cognition, executive functioning, social behavior, and fine motor control. It interferes with the process of absorbing critical minerals like iron, zinc, and calcium, which aid in the development of the brain and nerves. Regions such as the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingular cortex are also known to have a reduction in gray matter after exposure to lead. 
These regions are responsible for executive functions, mood regulations, and decision making. Men are also seen to have a greater loss in brain volume than women, which leads to them engaging in more antisocial behaviors. Since the early 20s, health professionals in the United States have warned against the threat of lead exposure. They were observing death and severe neurologic as well as psychiatric signs in workers who were exposed to manufacturing processes involving lead. In the 1940s, doctors further recognized that children impacted by lead poisoning suffered from permanent neurological damage, reporting impulsive behavior, short attention span, poor school performance, restlessness, and neurological signs. Even in the 1970s, studies involving lead exposure in children highlighted a decline in motor performance and behavioral disorders like constant need for attention and being easily distracted. Another study highlighted significant deficits in executive function and spatial awareness, stating that 10 micrograms of lead per deciliter of blood risks cognition damage in children. Now, even though during the mid-1920s, American physicians recognized lead paint as a serious and common source of contamination for lead poisoning, lead-based paints were still sold in the United States for the next half century. Instead, the inclusion of lead as a gasoline additive further steeply increased lead emissions in the 1920s. This soon became a political and scientific controversy, in which many physicians, geologists, epidemiologists, representatives of the lead industry, and the government members of many countries had become involved. Due to this intense investigation, lead is now one of the most studied environmental contaminants and has resulted in the United States introducing laws to rapidly decrease the emissions. Over the past 50 years, there has been a dramatic improvement in the air quality. And since the 1980s, levels of air pollutants that are known to be harmful have decreased dramatically, while lead as a gasoline additive was outright banned. There are several interpretations about what the lead crime hypothesis may be. As we have briefly mentioned, the most common way to explain this hypothesis is by noting that lead exposure can have impacts on crime rates as a person gets older. While this may indicate a correlation, this does not mean that lead exposure is the single causation to violent crime rates being higher. For this reason, it's still important to dive deeper into the hypothesis and look at some specific factors that researchers have studied. Studies by scientists have revealed many interesting things about the nature of the lead crime hypothesis. For instance, researchers found that maltreated children are at an increased risk for committing subsequent crimes and are more likely to have lived in neighborhoods with a higher likelihood of lead exposure. This brings an interesting perspective about how certain neighborhoods might be more likely to have children with higher lead exposure than others. Research also shows that houses built before 1978 are more likely to contain lead-based paint and have pipes, faucets, and plumbing fixtures containing lead. These houses are more common in low-income neighborhoods, which is how researchers were able to draw comparisons between different demographics when completing studies on this hypothesis. While this study may show a correlation between lead exposure and crime, it is also important to consider other factors that can be at play, such as drug use, employment rate, poverty, access to public services, politics, and mental illnesses. While this is a growing area of research, many researchers have begun to explore the different ways that they can test the validity of the hypothesis. For this reason, it's important to consider benefits as well as the drawbacks to the lead crime hypothesis. One of the main benefits of this hypothesis is that it considers the effects that have occurred from the 1930s to present day. This takes into account the long-lasting impacts that can occur, and many longitudinal studies are conducted where participants are repeatedly examined over a period of time to observe changes that have occurred. While these are some benefits, there are also drawbacks. For example, the baby boomer generation from the 1940s to 1960s are a generation that fall into line with this study. They were exposed to moderate amounts of lead, which is why they are typically studied in relation to the hypothesis. However, it's important for more studies to be done with other, newer generations, since the results from the baby boomer studies can often lead to the misconception of correlations being causations. In conclusion, we hope you now have a comprehensive understanding of what lead is in the respective public health issue. We have discussed an overview of the negative health implications and the prevalence rates of certain neurological diseases, particularly in the past century. By examining the context and research related to epidemiological trends in the lead crime hypothesis, we have gained a better understanding of evidence-based public health trends. We hope you enjoyed learning about the lead crime hypothesis. Thank you.